As we uh, enter into the portion, the preaching portion of our worship service this morning, uh, I want to remind you of of what we have to look forward to. Uh, I want to remind you of what of of the 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 life that we are living is not for nothing, and it is not fueled by our own our own will but it is fueled by the promise of a reality of of living with God forever in a in a way that he intended from the very beginning and it is symbolized and it is it is promised in the empty tomb because we have a we have a shared experience we we we, that that's coming we have a shared experience that that uh, has already happened in 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 a lot of you know for a lot of us in 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 our baptism, and we share that with our Savior. We we have shared experiences as we follow His example, and, and we love those that are in our communities, and, and we we share the love of God with them. But we have that shared experience, and we have the ultimate shared experience because we know. That unlike any, anybody else who has ever lived, our Lord's tomb wasn't empty, but is empty. And so will ours. And that should encourage and strengthen and motivate us to believe what He has told us. So this morning, as we, as we look at, as we you know, do this under the umbrella of the reality that, that we too will live forever with God in glory. So we're going to talk this morning about, as we go through this evangelism uh, uh, you know, study, and, and we've gone through the, you know, the concepts of, the, of evangelism 101 and 201, and it gets uh, increasingly uh, you know, more detailed and, and easy as we go along. I want to take a moment this morning and look at the, the, the story of Jonah as a case study because it is a great example of evangelism, right? Of, you know, because as we know, God gave Jonah this edict. He, he gave him this, this mission to go to Nineveh and, and preach the gospel or preach the good news or preach repentance. That, that's what he, and, and the good news, even back then, prior to Christ, the gospel, prior to the life of Christ, was that, hey, repentance is good news. Because, it's, because we can do it. Because God offers that to us. Changing and, and coming back to Him is, is an option. That, that's good news, is it not? I mean, good, it's good news that, that there's nothing we can do to leave God permanently. That he's always given us this option to return to him. And, and regardless of whether it was pre the death of Christ where, uh, you know, where the, the fullness of the, the plan and the, the grace of God was displayed or, uh, or post that, the reality is, is that returning to God is an option and I don't know of better news that's available to humanity than that right there. But then we read in, in John chapter 12, and the, and the reason I chose this is because it, it, it's, a, it's a conceptual verse that sort of paints a picture of, of what we struggle with. And when he, he says, and so as, as Joe's already read this morning, and I'm not just going to reread it, but the whole idea here that, that we see displayed in Scripture in John 12, 37 through 43 is that the, the, this concept that when the story of God is that, or the story that God is telling does not fit with the one that we want Him to tell. That, that's, what, that's what those people in their, that day were the Pharisees and the rulers and all that. That's what they were doing because the story that Jesus 
was telling them and that he was living in front of them was not the one they wanted God to tell. And, and I'm going to give you a, the, the, the ending conclusion today, my conclusion for this, and, and you know, it, I, I invite you to pray about it and you know, fast over this and, and meditate on it and, and allow it to, to and, and see what you think. Just, just as, you know, spend some time to see what you think. Because the, the concept that, that Jesus is, is giving us, that he's living, the reality that the story that he's telling is that God is, is really, really special. And the, the story that, that, that they wanted to tell, that the Pharisees and the, the, the leaders of the church of that day, uh, uh, the, the leaders of the synagogue, the leaders of the, of, of the Jewish faith, the story that they wanted to tell was that God's people are really special. And I don't know that we've changed the message since. Therein lies the confusion. Therein lies the, the confusion that produces the imagery that we have seen over the last week. Because we, we've done such a job of, of separating ourselves from, from society and culture and all that because we are so special. Just like the, the Israelites thought that, that their ch- being chosen was because they were so special. No, no, no. They were chosen because God is so special. And see, God, God you know, basically was telling Abraham, hey, I need a body, I need flesh on this earth, and I'm going to pick you to do some things to separate and, and to, to be that body, to be that family, to be the, the body of me on this earth. Because I'm so special. But what we have done is changed that message. And, 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 and when... The messenger comes along to, to reiterate just how special God is. And, you know, just like I, you know, like my kids on vacation, they're just happy to be there, you know. Well, we're just happy, you know, I, the message is God is so special and we're just happy to be here. So that's, that's why, you know, when, when you look at John 12, you know, that, that's the problem. Is that, well, because I, I want to be lifted up in front of people I want to be seen and I, I want the accolades of people more than God because that means I'm special but so that there's the concept that we're you know that we're going to be dancing all over today and so as we look at the the case study of Jonah remember that we are a continuation of the life of Christ when it comes to uh you know the 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 reality of evangelism the reality of of telling the old old story of, of doing that is that we are the continuation of the life of Christ, which is a privilege and a responsibility. The privilege is, is that we, we get to live as much of this life as we do with the hope and the joy and the peace and all of that of, of knowing that we are saved. And the responsibility is to live that way, inviting as many people as we can to live that exact same life. It isn't a gatekeeping life. It is a, a, an inviting life. It isn't a condemning life. It is an inviting life. We are the continuation of the life of Christ. And Jesus asks us to be a witness of, that, of the, the life that he lived and the things that he did and the, thing, the, the life that we are living and the things that we are able to do as well. And remember the very first sermon that I spoke about in this is that witnesses have to see something to be able to witness. We have to put ourselves into a position to see God working in our lives and doing amazing things in our lives so that we have something to tell. We're witnesses to the existence of two kingdoms. There is a a kingdom of this world, and then there is a a, a supernatural spiritual kingdom that that we get to be involved in and we get to experience. And so we're witnesses to to those two kingdoms. And you don't see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Now, that doesn't mean you got to get baptized to see the kingdom of God. 
What that means is you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. And, and, and so we cannot reduce the very powerful, very specific and special gift of baptism to some religious ceremony because that will not birth us into the new kingdom. That will not birth us into the kingdom. What we have to do is accept what that baptism represents and is really doing for us so that we can allow the Spirit of God to transform us because he says you got to be born of water and of spirit. You got to be you've got to go through what God has called you to go through and then allow his spirit to transform you. Then we can see the kingdom. And Jesus says that he has the potential to draw all people to him. So in as much as what we are doing in as much as what our lives are, are showing, and, and in as much as our lives are attracting people, is to the extent that we are being Jesus. That we are truly Christ-like. So like I say, I, I tell, my, you know, um, tell my sons this about, you know, because every, everybody wants to be leaders, right? Everybody says, oh, I'm a leader. I'm this. Well, I mean, maybe not everybody, but... But, you know, the, the something about the, you know, the Heinz personality that, you know, leadership is just, you know, something that, okay, well, I want to do that. And I tell my sons, you want to know if you're a leader? You want, you want to know if you're a leader? Well, here's the best way to know if you're a leader. Can I call on you to answer that one? How do you know if you are a leader? Turn around, look behind you, and if anyone's following you, you're a leader. If not, I don't care what you call yourself, you're not a leader. Jesus says he has the potential to draw all himself. Are, are, are people drawn to you? Are, are people drawn to you? Because if they are, then, then, you know, if they're drawn to you, it's because you are living the life of Jesus. Because he says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw people to myself. Are you a Christian? Are you Christ-like? Well, I don't know. How many people are drawn to you and your relationship with God? The great indicator. Great indicator. Jesus, so as, as we think about and and, and go into a season of, of trying to be evangelistic, are we lifting up Christ? Or are we lifting up our version of Christ? The question quickly becomes, why do you act the way that you do? I get asked this question all the time. By people in the church, people outside the church. Why do you do what you do? And a lot of times, it's not a compliment That wasn't supposed to be funny. Here's, here's what I have come up with. Christ followers do what we do based on our understanding and or reverence for Christ. Just, just think about that for a second. Write that down. The, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. What we do is based on our understanding of, of, of Christ, our understanding of God, our reverence for God. Now, if, if Christianity to us, being a Christ follower, is all about do this, don't do this, don't do these things, you can do this but not that, if it's all about the rules, then, then that's our understanding of God, that God is a taskmaster, a rule maker, and a, a, a lawmaker, right? But if, our under, if what we do is loving people, valuing people, pursuing relationships with people, then it's because our understanding of God is that very thing. Lost people act the way they do because they're lost. Let that sink in for a second. 
why do we get so angry? Why do we get so uh, uh, upset when lost people act lost? They're just doing what, it, what, what lost people do. Look at the, you know, this morning in our class, we talked about, you know, the book of Ezra. And in Ezra chapter 9, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you know, the prophet there who is so overwhelmed with grief over what the people of God are doing that he rips hair out of his beard, out of his hair, rips his clothes, and sits in dust and ashes for six hours just lamenting what the people of God are doing. At no time do you see the, this prophet ever you know, being that distraught over what the nations are doing because he understands lost people are going to act lost. The problem is when God's people act lost. So what we do and why we do it is a direct reflection on our understanding of Christ. So we got 10 minutes left. Let's get into Jonah. And it's not going to take that long, I promise you. So if you've got your Bibles, turn over uh, to Jonah, or don't. I mean, we're not really going to go word word for word, verse for verse. uh, uh, And I'm probably not even going to read a whole lot of it. Hold on. I, I mean, it would help if I could find it. You got to find Obadiah before you can find Jonah because they're right next to each other. There it is. Okay. Whoop! Found it. Thought for a second somebody stole it. So Jonah, very popular. There's songs about it. There, there's, you know, it's a, it's a great VBS story. It's a great Sunday school story. Uh, and and it's, it's controversial in, the, in a lot of scholarly realms today because there's, you know, there's a contingency of, of mainstream biblical scholars who are now saying, well, he probably is just a, a, a story, a parable, an allegory, something like that. It didn't happen. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I know this, Jesus believed it happened. So if Jesus believes in Jonah, then I'm, I'm going to believe in Jonah. And so the story goes that Jonah it was, a, uh, uh, was, a, was a prophet in Israel, and God comes to him and says, hey, or, or uh, you know, doesn't really come to him, but gives him this message and says, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach repentance to the people of Nineveh. Now, basically, it's like saying, hey, Reggie, I want you to move to Las Vegas. See, so Reggie's like, nope, 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 I'm... I'm not going, you know, so it, it's, it was awful. Nineveh was awful. Now, I'm not saying, well, I am saying Las Vegas is awful. I went there once, I'll never go back. But, I mean, it is just, you know, sin city, whatever, it's, it's you know, it's just terrible. And, and Jonah is like, um, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to go there. Jonah gets on a boat, heading the opposite direction, you know, then there's a big storm. Everybody on the boat is, is praying to their God. They see Jonah. He's asleep. And, he's, and here's the thing. Jonah is at peace in his disobedience because he knows why all this is going on. He's like, while you guys are waiting, and this is the thing I love about, uh, uh, about God's people all throughout Scripture and today, is that we know people are wasting their time with other gods but we're still not going to do much about it. He says, I, you know, look, y'all can waste all your time praying to this God, that God, whatever. I know why this is happening, because I'm running from the true and living God. And they're like, okay, well, what do we do? He says, well, if you throw me overboard, all this will go away. Lo and behold, they toss him overboard. See, you know, the storm stops. He's drowning. God sends a fish to save him. That's what saves him. Don't get, it wrong. Don't get it twisted. The fish that eats him saves his life because he was drowning and a fish comes and eats him and now he's, now he's not drowning anymore. He's in the fish three days, gets vomited up on the land. Now, now, all of a sudden, he's like, you know what, going to Nineveh is not such a bad idea. He goes to Nineveh, preaches the most effective sermon. He basically says, repent, 
and God will let you, you know, and God will let you live. Repent and, 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 you know, God will forgive you. And they do. They, they do. The whole country repents and, and even the, they even repent on behalf of the animals. So which goes to show you a real short sermon is, is oftentimes real effective. Now that was supposed to be funny. I tell you, I'm going to have to send you guys like a memo. before. So he does that. And then, and, and at the end of the day, and we can go through all this, but we don't have a whole lot of time. At the end of the day, Jonah is so upset that the people respond to the message and repent that he goes up and he sits out and he's just whining about all that's going on. Okay, here, that, that's the long and short of it. It's four chapters, you know, chapters. It's not very long. Read it this afternoon and, you know, you'll see that's basically the, you know, in a nutshell what's going on. There, and there's a whole lot of theological and doctrinal, uh, you know, nuggets in there that we're not going to get into this morning because, they're, you know, it's not really about those things. But what it is about why would Jonah, a prophet of God, not want to go to Nineveh? Now think about what we are trying to accomplish here in this sermon series, and it's encouraging us to be evangelistic, to tell the old, old story, well, not necessarily tell it, but live it, to live the old, old story. Why would Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? I've got a couple of thoughts on this surprise and and the most important one is that it was probably the same reason we don't want to go to whatever Nineveh we're faced with and that's because it's really really uncomfortable think about being the lone voice standing up in a uh, let's just go back to the opening ceremony, being the lone voice at that ceremony saying, what are we doing here? And trying to explain to people who are comfortable mocking the true and living God that, that that's not what God's about. Let me tell you about the true and living God. How comfortable would you be going up to people on the streets of France and explaining to them the glory and the graciousness, the compassion and the love and grace of Jesus Christ right in the middle of what you saw going on? Uncomfortable or comfortable? More uncomfortable. So that's why we don't want to do anything more. That we, we agree with Jonah. It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea to go to the Ninevehs of the world and to preach the gospel. And you know why? Because we don't understand the gospel any more than they do. Because we have a hard time seeing repentance as a glorious opportunity, as a gift of God. Because a lot of times we are so addicted to the to the uh, to this place in these act, in this world and these things and, and and we are so similar to those outside of Christ that we don't understand that repentance isn't a drag. Repentance is an opportunity. Repentance isn't a burden. Repentance is an escape. An escape from a life that has is defined by. And, and that is mastered by, that is controlled by death, and that r repentance is an escape from that. Repentance is, is, a, uh, is a wonderful opportunity to be in a relationship with the only life-giving and sustaining force of this universe. See, we think of repentance as, you can't do that. But what repentance really is, is don't forget you get to do this this is an option this life is an option this the life of christ isn't uh isn't to be looked at as as a hindrance or, or uh 
what's the word I'm looking for as a as exclusionary, but it's including all of the good things that we can't do in our natural selves. Would you rather, I mean, honestly, if given the choice between the two, I don't want to say emotions, but because they're not emotions, but between, between the two actions, would you rather hate or would you rather love? I mean, which one would you rather? God says, you come to me, repent, turn back to me, and you get to love. Even the unlovable, even the terrible people, you get to love them. And I will show you how. And he did that on the cross. Father, forgive them. Love is patient, love is kind, love love keeps no record of wrong. You get to love them. It's so much better. It's such a better life. It's better than anything we can come up with on our own. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because the same reason we don't. Why do we not want to go? He knew, another reason he didn't want to go to Nineveh, he knew God would forgive them. He even says that. I don't want to do that because I know what you're going to do, God. You're going to forgive these people. You see, just like in John 12, we know that God will act in a way that we don't like. If you think about it, read Matthew 20. You know what's in Matthew 20? Parable of, of, the, of the workers in the field. I, I mean, Scott, I don't know about you. I've been working in this field for a long time. How do you feel about people that show up 15 minutes before the end, get the same glory I get? I mean, think about it. How do you feel about that? I don't like it because I have a really bad understanding of what working in that field's all about, just like the older brother did. Just like the older brother. Because see, so often I see God as a slave master, restraining what I, you know, the life that I could have, that I want to have that I plan towards having, and that I hide, and, and all the things. I see God that way, and God's saying, you, everything that I have is available to you. What, what do you mean? I mean, what do you mean life with me is like slavery? Now, that's a, a fundamental misunderstanding of a relationship with God. And, and I've struggled with this for weeks is i don't know how to preach you into understanding the difference between that misunderstanding and the true relationship with god all i can say is you gotta live it you gotta do the things that seem hard you gotta visit you do all the things that jesus says on the uh, you know uh, on the sermon on the mount do all the things you know when we when we read the story of 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 you know you never visited me, you never clothed me, you never, you know, all those things, you know, and when did I see you naked and, and, and alone? When did I see you in prison? When did I see you? He says, when as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. We got to do it, we, we've got to live that life or we'll never get it. We'll never understand it. Talk to people. Like I've said before, one of the reasons I'm so big on, uh, on, uh, you know, the foster care and adoption and all that because, man, that is a life-changing event. Life-changing. You know why? Because when you are in that courtroom and you sign your name, there's no going back. Because it's easy to feel good about it on that day. I've been there. I've been in that courtroom, and I've done those things, and they say things like, you do know that the inheritance that you're leaving to your kids now goes to them as, you know, all of it. It's real, people. It's real, and there's no going back. And it's an easy thing to do on that day when you feel good about it, but what about five years later when these kids are acting like kids? You know, what about when you realize, you know what? I got this much, I, I got, I, I got, you know, when you go through, a, when you go through a wedding, 
and you realize I signed up for two more of these? And, and I'm just real talk because you know, you know, I, I like nice things. I can't buy a lot of those when you're paying for weddings like some crazy person. It's life changing and it's unalterable. And you get to, and, and you, what you experience is that if I'm going to make it through this, it's going to be God. It's going to be God. Because I can't do this on my own anymore. And believe me, I started that on my own. And I've had to since turn to God because it's that hard. But it's that glorious. So, all right, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, e, late. Why would God be so insistent on Jonah going to Nineveh? Here's the thing. God loves lost people as much as he loves you and me. Can you just sit and marinate in that reality for a minute? I mean, you know, we sing Jesus loves me and all that. God loves those lost people that we are to evangelize, that we are to love, that we are to go out and tell that lift up Christ. He loves those lost people as much as he loves any of us. In his grace, his grace seen, I mean, read Romans, read Paul. His grace seen in action in this life is his glory. It is absolutely, I mean, that's what sets God apart from every other God ever conceived of. It's his abounding love and his unending grace. And the more that we can display that, the more we glorify him. I, I think, and, and, and the minor prophet, you know, Micah and Haggai bear this out. I think that God is more glorified by the grace that we extend to lost people than all of the worship services that we can plan and carry out for two lifetimes. Because he has said, would that you close the doors of that church so that no one else would come in and experience your fake religion. Now, that, I paraphrase that, but that's the concept he's pointing out in the Minor Prophets. I, I, would, I would rather you guys not do that than people come in contact with, with a, a, a superstitious religion that you have concocted. God's grace is his glory. And as much as we can extend that to people, to, to, uh, to the lost, is as much as we glorify him. And so the last thing, and we're going to hustle through this, is that what can we learn from this story? What can we learn from the example of Jonah as you read through this? And, and, and the, the long and short of the end of the day, we're not special. God is. We are not the point. God is the point. And so as much as our humanity and, and, and our brokenness wants us to be in competition with the lost, God is saying, you're not. You're not in competition with them. It isn't about who worked the longest in the vineyard. It's about realizing that life in the vineyard of God is infinitely better than life outside of it. That working in the house of God, working in the, in the kingdom of God, living in the kingdom of God, seeing the kingdom of God is infinitely better even now than anything else this world has to offer. Now that's a story worth telling. That's a story worth singing about. And that's a story that will lift the confusion, quite possibly reduce the mockery. Can we, can we live that story? Can we live a story of, of grace, compassion, of acceptance and love? Accept people as God accepted us. Accept people in their brokenness and love them as God loves them.
The choice is ours. Will you join me in this difficult, glorious, wonderful Christ-following road as together we stand and as we sing?